a 247 page document yesterday. Everyone in this room can go to the website if you're on the interwebs. You can go, you can read it. We've leveled that playing field in terms of the access to the information. But there's still that critical component, which is the interpretation of the information. And, and you know, we've got Pete who's very much looking at price action. You're imagining you, you and your team more looking at, at the fundamental aspect, the, the profit margins and the like which is happening in, in the space. That's it. I think that's what uh, drives us to uh, buy or sell, sell stocks and we uh, largely manage portfolios for clients. It's a big part of our business. Um, but it is about going through those income statements, going through the balance sheets, running those ratios, all those things that they teach you in accounting and school even. It's as basic as that to see if this company is sustainable, if the earnings are going to grow over time, if the dividends are going to grow over time. And that's kind of the fundamental analysis part of it. I think you throw in a few qualitative things as well, like you know, are management any good? Uh, have they been telling you lies in the past? Or can you trust them? Have they got a good track record? Those kind of qualitative things as well. Look at the industry that a company's in. Those I would consider to be fundamental, um, a fundamental view of the company. And uh, we would take a fundamental view to buy something. Um, and we're not all technical analysts, but uh, uh, that might help you with the timing. Then. So listen, I like the share, it's going to do well over the long term. It fulfills all of the fundamental characteristics that I want. But when should I actually buy it? Would it be better to buy it today, wait a week or two, next month? Uh, and maybe that's with technicals would help you a little with the timing. Well, if we come back to you and the guys at Easy Equities, I mean, one of the things, many components to Easy Equities, but the two I want to touch on now. One is to, 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 to investing should be fun. If you're not having fun doing this, and I don't mean huge amounts of fun because if you have too much fun, you're probably losing money because you're lacking the discipline. But fun in the sense that this isn't, you know, boring accountants and grey suits and grey hair, um, you know, at the back of the office. But also, and I know it's a phrase that you guys use a lot, is the democratization of it. And almost in a sense saying, you know, if you're, if you're a shop right shopper, you're always a shop right, and your family's a shop right, and your friends are a shop right, because friends don't let friends shop and pick and pay. You've now said, well, you know, two, three checks, and you've got shop right checks. Yeah, absolutely. So it is very important for for beginners who doesn't understand what the market is going to do, or what to invest in, to first and foremost invest in the brands that you love and buy. Um, so if you're with Discovery, why not own a little bit of Discovery? If you, um, you know, if you with Vodacom. MCN, why not own a little bit of those shares? I mean, these are companies that you are supporting on a monthly, daily basis. Um, so that is that's that's the first part of it. Um, and the second part of that is, as soon as you have bought that first share, uh, you know, I think people, a lot of people, then suddenly realise that it's not that difficult to own a share. Um, and then you start learning furthermore. Now you want to know more about the company. Going to start looking for information about this company to see if this was the right choice that you made. Um, so yeah, it is, with easy equities, is absolutely a learning curve, um, and we're trying to make it as easy and fun as possible um, with a lot of information that we that our users can, um, can use. You know, I want to touch on derivatives, but I want to come back to derivatives at a at a at a, at a, at a later point. We'll talk around different derivative products available and. and pros and cons and then Petty's presentation which follows us will delve probably more into that in many senses in the, the trader space that, 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 that they have there. Pete, one of the things you're talking about, if you've got prices, you can start looking at the charts and the like. One of the big developments going back to late 2000 with Citrix but even more recently is, is exchange traded funds, ETFs. Uh, quick primer on ETFs. Uh, we had Narina talking about them this morning. She's back again. I think she's the fourth party session this afternoon. Narina Fissa. ETF is essentially a basket of shares. So you can buy an ETF that attracts the, the South African market. The 40 biggest companies that Discovery, the MTN, the Vodacom, all put into one basket. We buy that basket. You could get an ETF on the S&P 500. This is the, the US market in dollars. But we can buy it in South Africa in rands. It's nice. It's simple, it's cheap, it's easy, and we can get our exposure from that. We can then take that a step further and you can start saying, well, we can use that, 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 that uh, technical analysis. We can start looking at these indices and taking views on short to medium to long, and I want to come back to the time frames in a moment, but we can use that technical analysis to start perhaps timing entries, perhaps taking views on the market. The 
absolutely so true. Just perhaps a point I need to highlight is when you're driving an ETF, you need to understand the makeup of the ETF. So for instance, now you're going to trade the Satrix 40, you need to understand that your exposure to the spouse is more or less 20%. And when it's going to start moving to the wrong side, you need to realize, okay, I am exposed to a specific stock. But yeah, on, on, on the strategy side, I think there's a lot to do, or there's a lot from the, from the product to learn from, you know, at least expressing your views. If you've got a strong view, rather on, on the financials, rather try to sell to study. And remember also, as I've said previously, the market's obviously in a dynamic phase. So sometimes you need to be in a little bit resources phase, and for instance, perhaps more gold uh, eating it will be more appropriate to trade on a current market conditions. You, you want to go back to the timing issue, you guys at Phoenix, you're, you're engaging with, with clients and the like. What are the durations of, of your recommendations? And, I mean, some of them obviously, it's a bit of a how long is a piece of string. But are you talking typically hours, or days, weeks, months, quarters, years? Okay, that's a very good, good question. So to clarify, when I'm talking about short term, Yet again, I'm going to emphasize on the fact of dynamic. So it's depending on the security that you're dealing with. But in short, short term is more or less less than 15 days. So how do I know it? Because I will calculate it. So I will look back in history for a specific security. And I will go and calculate how often the trend is shifting from bullish to bearish. Now you've got at least some indication of how long a security will remain in a trend. Now let's move on to medium term. Same principle again. But medium term is moving to three to four months. And then long term is moving from six months beyond. So it's coming back to are you a trader so focusing on short term or are you an investor focusing on the medium to long term? And remember also the long term, let me rather say the medium to long term is also taking consideration the cycles of the fundamental analysis side. Okay. Yeah, can I just add that I think that's a very important point. I think you don't have to be an investor or a trader. I think you certainly have to look around your long-term investment profile, what it is you're actually doing in the markets. So there's space to have a bit of fun. And, uh, uh, you know, to me it's on the side. And uh, you want to buy those exciting shares and do that kind of trading thing. But uh, fundamentally, for the longer term, you really want to invest and grow your nest egg. And that's buying up a lot of those good shares, those quality shares, and you're probably going to keep them, a lot of those for the longer term. You can never just buy something and forget about it. Uh, we've, we've learned that even with some very quality top shares. But uh, for me, it's about having a long-term investment portfolio, as well as you know you want to be in the markets. You want to you want to play some of the trends, buy some of the momentum stocks. Um, you know, get out of them. But for me, that trading piece is in your fingers. It's a little bit smaller, and maybe as I get older as well, the investment piece gets a bit bigger. Um, but but I think that's a fundamental difference between investing and trading. And this this space for both. There's space for both. And there's a key point here, which is investing is not something like a hobby you take up. Like you take up golf and you play golf a bit and then your your knee goes bad and you get rid of the golf clubs or maybe you just never actually play golf very well, so you throw them in the lake or something like that. Investing is something you start frankly as early as possible and you pretty much do until until day end. And if you've done it well, the real benefit is, is twofold. We leave assets to our heirs. Um, and we leave knowledge. We, we're, you know, I think many, I mean, certainly on this panel, I, I was fortunate. I got, the reason I got involved as a, as a 12 year old kid was because my grandfather had a passion for the stock market. So I had someone in my family who could talk to me about shares and, and explain to me stuff. But I think for a lot of folks that's not the case. But it is, you know, the time frames, peaks might be shorter, yours might be longer. But the bigger picture time frame is this is something we're going to do forever. That's right. And I think also an important point is a lot of people think about retirement um, and that, that old view that on the day you retire you must be all in cash. Um, and we're living a lot longer these days. And uh, you know, you've got to be in equities, you've got to grow your portfolio over time. But uh, you've probably got to be in those risky assets whilst you're retired. Maybe you're going to downscale them a bit, but this is a game for life, really. Well, to you, to, I mean, you mentioned a moment ago, you know, start with discovery, start with the excuse me, the M10 and the like. What you're essentially alluding to there is to, to build that portfolio. A portfolio of, of diversity that comes back to, to Craig's point and it comes back to Pete's. You don't want all your eggs in one basket. You want that diversification. You want to, but you I mean on day one you can buy an ETF, but few of us have got enough money that we can go and on our first day of investing, we can go buy 15 quality stocks. We build that slowly over 
over time, which might be days, weeks, it might be months or years. Yeah, absolutely. But um, with these here, the tissue can put down whatever you'd like to on those uh, stocks. So if you're looking at a Capitec stock trading at 800 to 90 bucks a month somewhere, um, you know, like if you've got 5 rand, 10 rand, 100 rand, you can start participating in it with your fractional share on um, and still participate, not leaving money out of the, out of the market. Um, and definitely, next month put in another 100 bucks, and another and another. Wealth building takes time. Over the long period of time, you're going to start accumulating all of that wealth. Um, you're going to diversify your portfolio with some really good ETFs. You've got property ETFs. Um, uh, you've got uh, resources ETFs. So if you want to, that short term, you know, side without breaking your mind with a one specific resource company you want to look at, uh, is to buy something like that. Um, so yeah, you're going to build it over the long term. So I've got four nieces, each of them has got their easy equities account. Um, Tristan is five years old, she's loving her easy equities account. I put in a hundred bucks, her mom puts in a hundred bucks. You know, and that's where it starts, it's at the younger ages. And the longer the time you have in the market, um, the bigger chance you'll have in a really nice nest egg. Um, I do want to go to your niece for a moment. So you said she's five. Yeah. What is the limit on or the restriction, if any, on opening an account, an account for, for a newborn or a five-year-old or a 12-year-old? Uh, as soon as they have a birth certificate, you can open their account. As soon as they have a birth certificate. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so there really isn't any age limit um, on easy equity sneakers as far as young as possible. Talking very much the, the DIY, the do it yourself, uh, you know, go and decide your own stocks. And I create you in many senses the other extreme, which is the managed account, where, where or, or even have funds, whether they be ETFs, we've touched on in the good old classic unit you know, trusts, which of course we know all about. And, and again, we've seen the purple spot there in terms of fees that have come under pressure. And there was a time that was a few years ago where you know the robo advisors were going to put it out of business and the ETS were going to put it out of business. My sense is that's still a viable option for, for probably the majority of people to sure have an easy equities account, some space you manage your own, but to also carefully go and find a asset manager, whether it be a, a collective investment or a managed account, for, for, for some of slash all of your funds at the same time. Yes, well that's that's kind of in our name as well. We do both of those parts, private and asset management, then the stock breaking stuff. And as you say, it's self-managed versus somebody's managing it for you. And it just depends on the level of involvement you want to have in your, your investment portfolio at the time. If you uh, if you want to spend the time um, and understand the shares and, and, and find the right shares to buy, that's great. Um, but if you haven't got the time, that's when you get an asset manager to, to do it for you, hopefully. Those guys spend all day, every day, looking at the markets, analyzing shares. That's their bread and butter. So uh, the hope is that they're going to do uh, a good job for you. But uh, I think at, at the end of the day, it's really about understanding the investment that you're in. So if you're not going to understand the shares, then it's better to let somebody else do it. But even with an ETF, picking an ETF, uh, picking your own portfolio of stocks, or these fancy products or derivatives that you might talk about, you know, basic, basic principle is that you must understand what you're buying what you're what you Even if you come into an asset manager or a unit trust, as I understand the asset manager's philosophy, the unit trust's philosophy, that sort of information. You know, if it's a unit trust that's only invested in you know, Chinese tech startups, you know, understand what that risk quantifies in the life. Exactly. They look at these different investing styles, different asset managers have different styles, and they do uh, perform at different times. Um, value stocks had a Toro time for many, many years, and then they, they shot the lights out with a uh, you know, stratospheric return, but that was for one year, but that made up for the five years before. And the one lucky value fund was just, just the style. So there's growth that you hope will just go up over time. So it's really about understanding the style and exactly what you're buying when you invest in anything. Very interesting. As a technical analyst, obviously there's fundamentals and the like happening. Are you purely prospect, almost to a sense that you're looking at something that almost doesn't match to you what that something is? Absolutely. You get so many times that you're looking at a chart, you can see something that's, that's got its cooking or going on behind the scenes, but you can't pinpoint it. But then eventually you will see something coming out, like a trading update, a negative trading update, and now the picture is almost like you're filling up. And then you can 
almost like pinpointed to say exactly somebody somewhere with the technology age, I won't call it new something, but there's def definitely some, something on the news flow that you can quantify to say you can at least see it on the chart. I want to start to touch quickly, I want to touch on some tax free. We know the JC has spoken about it and they've got a lot of information on the website uh, and perhaps you can chat to them. But let's quickly touch on, on, on the tax free. Craig, have you seen a lot of take up from, 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 from people, a lot of interest from your client base into, into tax free, either into managed or, or self managed? Um, we have seen take up of the tax free. I think the market have been waiting for that for a long time. But um, I still don't think it's got the traction that the government would have hoped it would have had this year. Certainly there's more guys on the accounts on a frequent basis. But uh, I, I, think, I think overall the market could be a lot better. Uh, maybe an educator and, and getting those people into tax free savings account um, where it's appropriate. Well, I don't know whether the fair opinion is the equity, they are automatically given a, a tax free account. Are folks making use of that, or are they still going to the, 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 the vanilla account in a sense? Um, no, so it's twofold. You've got the guys that you know would like to play a little bit more in the market uh, with their single stocks, and in the tax free savings space, you've got the ETFs. Um, we've got a managed solution also on easy equities there where the asset managers uh, look after that tax free saving more in the normal account. Uh, but we are actually, we, we, we are seeing a lot of people making use of the tax free savings account. And I think it's definitely, like you said, it's about educating uh, investors about what that 33,000 rand a year can actually do for you in 15 years time. Um, that's that's what I'm going to do. Quick, yeah, it's the tax free, there's some limitations to it. You can invest 33,000 per person per year, um, but that person could be you and your partner. You've got two kids, that's four people you can put 33,000 a year into, which is like picking up to 132,000 per year for a family of, of, of four. But you can't go and buy individual shares, you can only buy those ETFs. You can buy a, a local top 40 ETF, you can go and buy a, a S&P 500 ETF. What we have seen since uh, then Minister, uh, Finance Minister Nene introduced it back in 2015, yep, 2015 was the first year, yeah, um, is, is, is a take up to it, but I, I'm with Craig, I think there's still a lot more space to it. I think for the, for the average person out there who, who doesn't really want to get their hands dirty, who just wants a nice, easy, simple process, tax-free account is really that first port of call. In your first 33000 per year, you can put into your tax-free, and then if you've got extra money, you can start going and looking at, at different investments and, and different strategies and methodologies. And then the key point that Wayland said is 15 years, but you can tell he's a young kid, because to him 15 years is a lot of time. Um, you know, to me, 30, 40, and if you're starting this for a five-year-old lease, that is potentially a 60-year journey. The power in 60 years, now we don't have 60 years, well, we're going to live a lot longer, but we don't really have 60 years. But I've got a niece and nephew who are 7 and 9, and, and I've been buying them ETFs since they were, they were both born, respectively, 7 and 9 years ago. And they're doing okay, but that power is going to be, not when they're 10 or 20 or 30, the real power is going to be, and they're going to get the money when they're 50 years old. And they're going to hate me, because they're going to have to wait so long. But uh, I'll be dead and there will be a giant pile of money. So they can't really, really complain in, in that space. I, I, I want to start looking at, at uh, the, 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 the offshore component. Um, we certainly, again, if we go back to the, the olden days when the three of us were around, offshore was, it was hardly possible. It was deeply, deeply complicated, I suppose we say. I mean, Pete, just from a, from a, from a perspective of, of a technical analyst, the data is available. Perspective of transacting, it really has become a lot easier. Absolutely. As I was mentioned with the technology technology age, the information is so widely available, but now it's still up to you to go and sit and to, to realize what is good information and what's bad information. Well, then you guys have just come with your, your easy equities of so I can now go and buy a, an Apple share if I want to the like. There's still the biggest challenge perhaps to offshore is is a, a, a reserve bank and getting physically getting the money offshore. Getting take a, offshore. Yeah, we can take a million rand per person per year 
and a million rand is a large amount of money unless you're Coast Baker or Patrice Vesepe. For most of us, that's plenty, but there's still a lot of red tape involved. Yeah. Um, so we have tried and made that process as easy as possible. Um, you still have to deposit funds into your US account or into our US account uh, through your bank's um, you know, uh, currency converter or, or branch. Um, but in that, you know, it, it's a great opportunity to gain access to the global market in the single stock space. Uh, whereas right now, it's very difficult to just go and buy an Apple share or Microsoft or um, you know, Berkshire Hathaway. Um, that opportunity that's on easy equities right now uh, is quite great. However, it is difficult to get that money off, get that money back in. So, yeah, but. Um, Craig, there's, there's, there's undoubted benefit to having money offshore. And it's not, not because of our politicians, because let's be honest, they've got Donald Trump, so it's politicians around the world. Um, but there's, there's diversity. We don't have an Apple. We've got a 10 cent with an Apple. We, we have a Bitfest, not a Berkshire. They're kind of similar. You, are your clients, I mean, I, my sense is, particularly in the last year or so, people have been scrambling to get money offshore. My sense is, yes, but it needs to be within a bigger picture and a bigger strategy for an investor. Yes, typically investors, uh, well, investors want to rush offshore when the rent's weakening. They never want to go when it's strong. So that's uh, our job as asset managers to try and tell people, listen, when the rent's looking strong, that's when you should actually be looking to take those funds um, offshore. But uh, similarly, we, we have, uh, also have access to individual shares on, on the platform. We also have a managed global equity portfolio. Um, so again, you get the managed and self-managed, but in the offshore space, which was kind of unheard of a long time ago. Um, so there again, it's, it's exactly the same. You do your fundamental analysis, whatever it is, you just buy an offshore share. And for me, the key thing is to have, you have to have offshore assets. You can look at your own personal situation and decide how much that should be of your overall wealth um, and maybe get advice on that. But you need to have some wealth offshore and this is our ideal way to do it. Um, as well and said, I think you, that million rand I think isn't too difficult to get offshore. Um, it's when you want when you need more of that 10 million there. Yeah, it's the next limit which is the paperwork starts picking up uh, But again, it's about just those offshore portfolios taking depositing dollars offshore and uh, well I'm sure it's the same with these entities. Just on our side to go have some stock brokers on Coza and you can log into the same portal and buy a bit vest and an offshore share at the same time, Google or Apple or whatever it is. And in the book distinction, I've always done the, the lazy offshore route to a degree, which is I'll buy Richmond. They make most of their money offshore. Um, you know, I'll go and buy MTN who, who make their money in emerging markets and the like. And they lose money in emerging markets. Well, <laughs> MTN was a bad example. As I opened my mouth there, I suddenly step back from that point. Um, and that certainly fits and is a, is a perfectly good strategy and in fact we can look at our at our market and a lot of profit made on the JSC. Just because they're a JSC listed company, they might be listed in Johannesburg, but they're making money beyond the borders of South Africa. You know, Richmond's selling their overpriced watches in, in Beijing and, and Paris and, and other such places. And that strategy works, but we still want to say there needs to be some actual capital offshore, so we can have our rich one here, but let's put some actual capital in dollars or euros or something and, and, and benefit from, from those different markets. You, you just never know where you're going to be later on in last years. Peter, I want to touch on derivatives after this, but one of the issues are if someone's not in a derivative space, they can't make money in a downside view. Do you look, you, you talk around, you go crunch the numbers, when you wake up on a Monday morning, you sort of start on planet Earth and say, right, which markets are strong, which markets are, are, are not, or maybe commodity space, and sort of zoom in from that sense, and, and probably, I mean, I don't know, but there's 100,000, 200,000 different things out there, it's almost any of them, and you're just looking for those ones that are creating opportunity, in many senses, agnostic as to, as to the way it's or the why's. Absolutely, and it's coming back to a discipline, so when I will start in the morning, I will have a quick look what one of the world indices did. So just to get a global view, so the S&P, the Dow, and so forth. And then I will break it down to at least on, to say sector-specific stuff. So what did the financials do? What did the resources do? 
and then breaking it down into what did the gold do, what did the platinum do, and eventually with what did the interest rates do. And then and eventually we'll see how the whole picture is it's playing out. And remember also, I just want to make a, a key point on, on the investing and on the trading side. Before you're going to do any trading or any investing, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to put a stop loss. When it's going wrong, you're going to set the stop loss for yourself. So you know when it's getting there, you're going to stick with your discipline and you're going to get out. And then also in the same exercise, you're going to put your first target in. Because now, if you've calculated that this run is about 7%, now it's always when you're getting a 3% you want to take your profit. So it's always one of those. Let your profits run as well. Stick to your discipline and keep with what you have in, with, with your experience. And now it's coming back to the same thing as, as well. When you're going to decide on a trade, either be crazy, indie, or whatever, first of all, make sure that the run, the run about 7%, 10%, it's worth the money that you're going to spend. So what I'm basically saying is, it doesn't help you spending 5% or 5,000 5, 5, Rand on a 2% run. So rather spend 5% or 5,000 Rand on a 10% run. So match it with the money. Yeah, and I have been talking, and if a technical analyst, it's great. I bet that your mornings are pretty much the same. You're, you're, you're looking at what's happening, you're looking at a data that's come out overnight, maybe there was you know, non-farm payrolls in the US, or the that's how often doing, etc. And, and you're building that picture, and when a stock that you like proves you wrong, you, 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 you get out. You, take, you, know, you don't want to hold them all the way to an African bank type of scenario. You're still saying, you want to be in the, in the winners, and you want to try and avoid the losers. And if our winners become losers, we'll deploy the capital somewhere else. That's right. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, I chuckled a bit at MTN. We were long MTN when the, when the news about the yeah, fire I mean, you was everyone. in our portfolios. <laughs> and uh, look, at that time, then we took the investment decision that, you see, we didn't know how it was going to pan out. Um, it, was a, it was a massive fire. We knew where it was going to go. So we said discretion is a better part of valor, and we will just come to that position as well. Um, if I think we've successful in our portfolios. We had a, a bit of an overweight position. A little while ago, we had the Lake Charles project update, uh, overruns on that, you know, the, the benefits of that project were coming down just to match what, they were, what the, the cost of their capital was going to be. So overall, we thought the earnings were going to be impacted, so they had a fundamental difference. Um, we didn't get out of SAS completely, we reduced our exposure, but we actually did not it. But it's those kinds of things that, that news on the day that, that might make you think we never hear something and then immediately just go out and sell something buy something, we, uh, we think about it, um, uh, you know, and, and, and start off uh, as well the other day, yeah. um, tax stories, litigation, whatever, or investigations, um, the share drops massively, uh, then you have to take a, 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 as an investor, to think, is there any merits behind this, do you believe what the company is saying, um, and, and then you have to make a, make a choice, do you stick with it, uh, or would you just cut it? So again, it talks to maybe, you know, if you had a stop loss there, you would have been stopped out on that one on that particular day. Um, but then, come back to fundamentals, was that just a one-off, or is this share actually going to do well over the next 10 to 15 years? I mean, really, we operate in an industry where we have, we have imperfect information. I kicked off this session by saying we have amazing access to information. You know, we can go in and, and, you know, you mentioned Lake Charles, which is where Sass was built in the UK Packer plant. So that's between uh, uh, Houston and Louisiana, and we've had uh, the Harvey storm recently. And I was able to track it, I was able to get a sense of rainfall. For the record, the rainfall at Lake Charles is approximately yo much. So they've had a lot of rain there. Um, Sasso to date haven't said anything, perhaps their computers are underwater. But we operate with a lot of information. But we've almost got to get comfortable in some senses that we don't have perfect information. Now, even when Sasso gives us an update, it's not perfect. Their first Lake Charles, when they planned it, X numbers. They come back a couple of years later, they revise them. A lot of it is on balance of probability. This one over that one. Well, I think, um, you know, if you do hold any of, if you do hold stocks and something does go wrong, um, you know, the, the opportunity to always buy a little bit more as soon as the price goes down to average out your purchase price. Uh, so you've got that option. Um, other than that, we've got really good communication, we've got our fundamentals. Um, our fundamental analysts 
uh, sends out this information about these companies, you know, uh, maybe to buy or to hold. Um, so, you know, you've got that type of information that our investors can then use to make their own decisions whether they want to sell them, buy more, uh, or hold their positions. I want to touch on, on I want to go to bonds, I want to go to, to, to the other investments. I think many of us, if we are employed, probably have a pension or provident fund, uh, potentially have a retirement annuity. Um, Pete, in many senses, the, the, these investments that we have, and in theory we're not touching them until we're 65 or older, do we take that into an account as part of our bigger investment picture? Or do we just simply park it aside and say, you know what, that's there, I'm putting my money into it, that will come in many years' time, and just look at isolation and what we're doing in our, in our own accounts? Just never put it to the one side and forget about it. We're all educated, we all have got some sense of what's happening in the world. So what I'm basically saying there as well, keep an eye on your investments. Even if you can't, can't touch it, just keep an eye to say at least you know when it's going wrong, that I can align my strategy going forward. You know, either I need to set up a new business or whatever to fill that gap in my you know, future income. Well, I mean, Craig, what I've done, perhaps because I'm a total math market nerd, I mean, I've gone to my retirement annuity and I break it down into pieces. And then I add my investments into it. I make these wonderful Excel spreadsheets with colors and lines. I mean, it looks totally lovely and mostly causes headaches. Yeah, am I taking it too far? Am I just being the, I mean, can I, as Pete says, I need to keep an eye on it. I need to check performance. I need to check fees. Can I make that totally passive or do I need to, to get perhaps a little more grubby with my sort of pension, provident, RA products? I think two things though, one thing, it, it all depends how much you want to be involved with, whether you just hand it off to somebody and say they're the expert, and uh, 10 to 1 you're paying them a fee, and probably a good fee, whether they do a good job or not, but you're paying some of the fee to, uh, to use their expertise to do the job for you. And then again, I think the other thing is about every individual should have their long-term investment plan. Um, whether you get someone to help you work it out or have it for yourself, you need a plan, and that plan will dictate what assets that you need to have in that plan. So you can go to your extreme and uh, look at all the assets, look into your RA and, and work out your whole asset allocation, how much you've got in bonds and, and whatever, um, you know, list of property, cash, equities. Uh, but at the end of the day, you need to have the right asset allocation that will give you the outcome that you want at the end of a certain time. So maybe you just take it to the extreme or you're just a market nerd and you just like that kind of stuff. But that's really, it's about having the right asset allocation for your investment objective. And uh, you either pay someone to do it for you or you have a look at it and do it yourself. So you kick the door open, so let's stay with you. That's an allocation. We've been talking shares, we've been talking apples and pick and pays and MTNs and ETFs and the like. What about listed property? What about bonds where you and both started your career? Or perhaps money market? How important is that in, a, in an overall portfolio? Could we say that's been managed there? I mean, the folks in the audience like, yeah, I need to go get themselves go look at some growth props or high props or, or, or sorry, growth point, high prop and the like. Well, if you look at government regulations, it's Regulation 28 about long-term pension fund money. They've got a, a certain requirements about what is the maximum you can have in equities. And so if a government thinks you should have a maximum and not 100% in equities all the time, then maybe it's something to think about that, you know, maybe there's something in this uh, that you should have more your eggs in one course. And while you diversify your equity portfolio, you're buying 10, 15, 20 shares, whatever it is, you also need to diversify across the asset classes. Um, what the, the makeup of that will look like will depend on your investment objective and maybe your life stage as well. Uh, so when you're younger, you've got a long investment time horizon, you probably have more uh, equities, fewer bonds, but you, you need to have some bonds if you're a fixed income. Listed property stocks is another sort of equity with, a, with an income component as well, and then a little bit of cash as well. So you need all of those asset classes. I think every investor needs all of those asset classes. It's just the mix that will change for each person. Well, my niece has got everything, but she ain't got bonds. Um, Pete, I mean, bonds, I mean, my sense, I, I once spent a, a, a day with a bond trader. Um, it was great fun, but the price didn't move. And I, it did not move for an entire day. It was like you know, fun but deadly boring because there's no activity. Are bonds really, do you relegate them off to the long-term investors? Are they something that can be tradable? Are they a new universe? 
do you say, no, thanks, but I don't really need that. No, it's definitely something that you need to keep an eye on as well. Why I'm saying this, because we call it the secular emphasis in a market. So what this is basically meaning, if you've got high equity markets, you've got low interest rates, now somewhere along the point in time it's going to tip. Now you're going to get high interest rates but low equity markets. So you need to be a little bit more awake on that. And that's what I'm saying, it's going back to what Craig also said in the asset allocation, just be a little bit more savvy on that move. So I know that we've got currently, let's call it relatively low interest rates, but somewhere it's going to move up. We call it the super cycles, grand super cycles. But somewhere those cycles are finishing off. And now coming back to the point of, let's say, trading bonds. Remember now, tra trading bonds is the opposite of equities. So when you go to buy a bond, you will see that the price will be going down. And uh, the opposite. So for instance, now you've got a home loan. Now you need to engage yourself with interest rate exposure. Why don't you do it with a bond? I mean, you know, you know, you start touching on bonds, you start touching on property and the like, and it seems to get complicated. But I can open an easy equity account, I can go buy property stocks, um, but I can do it simpler. I can do this whole as an allocation with a couple of ETFs. I can get myself equity, local or short. I can get myself property, local or short. I can get myself bonds. Uh, I can go buy the, the ABCNF LB, and there's others out there as well. I can do this in a and a very few, couple of nice and easy ETFs can be totally diversified. I can even be Regulation 28 compliant if I want to go read up what that will mean. Yeah, so um, we've got this great basket uh, options that you can take up with easy. Um, and within that basket, you've got different allocations. So, you know, you, you kind of sort of know how much risk you want to take in the market, but we've got risk alive. So, risk alive spits out a risk number, you answer four or five questions, and you know you are, you know, either aggressive investor, conservative, we just want to make some capital. Um, now, according to your risk number, we've put together these baskets with with different uh, weightings, so you've got the, the momentum, um, the, 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 the one is the momentum ETF, in there that's quite high, that's 15%, because you know, in print on the other side is the momentum strategies. Uh, then you've got global property, you've got local property, you've got the US access, you've got world markets, um, you've got resources in there, so it really does give you a great mix. There's about eight or ten different ETFs in there. Monthly basis, you can just keep on supplementing those ETFs without really breaking your brain about what you invest in. Um, so yeah, they, on easy equities, you can build a portfolio of ETFs, uh, and that's such a great way of creating diversification within your portfolio. Okay, we still have commodities in our portfolios. When my grandfather was teaching me back in the 80s, there were two rules to investing: buy, pick, and pay, and buy gold. And have those just a little bit in your portfolio. Now, well, the pick and pay story, you know, by shop rush, friends don't take friends shop and pick and pay. I'm talking about book yards and Jets, I own shop rush Is there still a space for commodities? Maybe it's platinum, maybe it's gold. Is that classic? You've got to have 5% in that alternative investment strategy. It's still, you know, there in the, in the rules of Amazon. Well, to be honest, I mean, the last week during the course of this year, we've added um, some gold exposures through a gold ETF because that's the easiest way sure. to invest in gold. I think it takes away all the, the mine management, the accidents, the leverage, all of that. It's just the pure rare value of gold. We put a little bit in our balance portfolio, which, which the balance portfolio has all of the asset classes, so we have a small exposure to gold. Um, and then, you know, we'll in our global equity portfolio as well. Um, just looking at our global equity portfolio, it's very dollar heavy. A lot of those big tech stocks are all listed on the, um, the S&P and Dow stocks. Um, and those are stocks you want to hold. So we're trying to diversify a little bit more into Europe. I think Europe's growing a bit. And then you also put in a bit of gold. So we think that if the dollar weakens, the dollar will do well. Um, and all the saber rattling is going on and people are chucking bombs over Japan. You know, maybe a little bit of insurance isn't a bad thing. So we do have a small... Um, a small building in, in the gold ETF, but we, we never married to it. <laughs> never married to it. I mean, back in the day, they, they, you, you had to be married to gold, and that was the rule in the 80s as a South African investor. You had, what, 50 gold mines from the JC alone. Pete, commodities, do you, do you preference them? Do you not? Do you find them 
more or less volatile relative to equity or the like, or they're just for you another another chart and another set of prices. No, no. Also, are you will take into consideration, especially remember now, gold prices obviously drives platinum prices and so forth. So the ones leading to the next thing. So also now, just to give you some indication as well, when is the best month of the year for gold? So this current month September, which is the second best month of the year for gold, was August. So when did this gold trading all this started in August? So now it's coming back to some key aspects in the market. First of all, you need to focus on cycles, what I've mentioned on the best month of the year. And then it's coming back to trend, follow the trend. And then the last one, it's momentum, that you need to follow at least the momentum. Swim in the right direction, don't swim upstream. I am running my time, I just got flashed a time warning, um, but I'm going to quickly open it for some questions, and then if they've done questions, I'm going to come back, I've got something for my panel, and I'll ask question for them, which I don't know happens at all. But if there are any questions out there in the audience, to someone in my panel. So, is there a mic for the gentleman? Oh, it's your mic. <laughs> Greetings. I just like to find out from the panelists which financial instruments would you recommend for a university student? Because I'm currently trading Forex, right? So I'm trying to use the profits that I make from that to go into other financial instruments, say ETFs, stocks, or bonds. But I want to find out which ones you recommend for a student and if which one you say would allow me a better time horizon. The, the answer here was not the FX. Was that the answer? Yeah. So in FX trading, if you're making money with the stick, I'm going to give my five cents and offer it to the panel. My sense is, I always say to folks, start with the ETFs. Start with the core of ETFs. Once, you know, or, or manage money, collect investments, be that, maybe you can even take it as far as hedge funds. Start with that core. And then around that, start adding individual stocks. And then around that even, start to add the trading. So look at my portfolio, half of it in ETFs. 30% in big stocks, 10% in small stocks, 10% in my trading space. The difference is, you know, I'm way, way more than you are down that line. I mean, I would, you know, I've been doing this for decades, you're just starting out. I said to folks, start with that ETF base. It's perfect for the low knowledge, you know, you buy an ETF, unless the world really ends. And I mean, I don't mean the world gets wobbly, I mean, unless it properly ends, your ETF is going to outlive you. I think it's about diversification then, and I would start with an equity portfolio, putting an equity portfolio together, and, and with an ETF. So that helps you, you're not going to pick one stock which you might get wrong, or two stocks, you've got a whole basket of shares, the diversification is built into that. So just to get general market exposure, however you want to do it, you know, unit trust ETFs, but just general equity exposure then, build on that. If I might give you some direction there. Obviously, you have start with Forex, but I think you need to move away. Because if you want to lose money, trade Forex. Everybody's selling this, you can make 2,000% off the Forex market. Rather go and gamble, I think you will do better. I mean, for the record, I, I've been trading for 22 years. Um, I spent five years losing money. I started trading Forex two and a half years ago and I started making money about a year, a year and a half ago. And that's with decades of experience. I learned to trade in the index market um, and learned my skills there. And once they were massively refined, I moved into the forex space. Because the first time I tried forex back in the early 2000s, Bank of Japan intervened in the market and I'm lucky to still have fingers. More questions from the audience? Ma'am, yes. Gratification is a, a good strategy. Well, look. Um, so if you if, you know 
know, you get a lot of our clients that goes, you know, I want to buy, uh, I want to buy all the stock now. When can I have access to to, to your Apple stock? Um, and I think getting that process up and running to allow people to do uh, purchase any type of stock uh, that they might think about immediately once they've made that decision and not go through a long-winded process. Um, I think definitely, you know, we are anyone, I think from 35 downwards is uh, part of the millennials. Um, and stockbrokers nowadays need to, need to, you know, cater for the millennials. Who is into instant gratification, who wants it now, um, and who wants to pay a very small price for, for doing that transaction. So yeah, I think, you know, for the millennials, definitely make it as easy as possible to get it done. About convenience and ease of doing the trade, not really impulsive trading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So impulsive trading is never good for anything. No, 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 no. But, yeah. but if you want to buy that more words, the research is there. Yes, there. Click the button yeah. and you can do it. Ladies and gents, we're doing our time, so I can throw a last question to each one of our panelists. And if you want, I'm sure they can hang around for a bit. I know that many of them are out there in the, the, the stands as well. You can chat to them afterwards. Um, and well, this is going to be a hard one for you, so I'm going to start with you. But it's almost impossible to, for you to answer it. What advice in the investment space would you give to yourself when you were leaving school? To start immediately. Um, stay away from debt. Uh, I think it's a very important one. And you took mine. Craig, we are older, way back in the 80s when you were leaving school. What do you wish you had known and done back then? Or maybe you didn't. I mean, what was the secret? No, well, I'll tell you very, very early on in my, in my working career, um, a very senior one trader told me, to me as such, said what you really have to do to make money over the longer term is to buy good shares and stick with them. Now, that's, that doesn't mean ignore them, but at that point in time, I remember I got a 2,000 Rand bonus that year, a lot of money, and uh, Sassel was trading at 50 bucks, and she said go and buy some Sassel shares at 50 bucks. So that's what I did. And now you know there's a lot uh, way down the line, you know you've grown your wealth over, over time. So uh, that's one thing I would have, uh, I, would have, I still tell everybody, if there's one rule of investing for me, it's buy quality, call it shares, quality investments, and stick with them. And again, with that caveat on the stick with them, it's more about the long term, not, not ignoring it. Yeah, and don't panic. I mean, I've got some stocks that have done spectacularly well for me um, over, you know, years. I mean, we're talking 15, 20, 25 years. One of the key points was there were times when it looked like, you know, like the crash of, of 98, the, the crash of 2008 and the like, where panicking seemed the best answer. But I'm like, you know what, shop right. People are always going to be eating. I'm not selling my shop right shares. Um, and, and they've done incredibly well over, over multiple decades. I mean, you know, my shop right's a 25 bagger over 20 years, um, but a lot of that was you know, not focusing on the short term, saying you're always going to eat. Pete, to you, what do you, what, 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 what was advice to you? What do you wish had been advice to a, to a younger Pete? Do not let out your ears. I'm going to say it again. Do not let out your ears. Like Why am I saying this? Because there's so many people that's you know apparently good investment advice people. Yeah, you get good people. At the end of the day, you must make your investment decision your own. You are all clever people, you are educated people, all of us, stick to your rules, stick to your gun. Follow your strategy, follow your discipline. I like that. Don't lend out your ears. My advice is simple. Um, particularly when you start earning, I remember when I first started earning money, it was brilliant. It just meant I could spend more money. Um, and the lesson I wish I'd had back then was simply spend less than you earn and save the difference. And if, if you're unemployed, I appreciate the complication. But if you are employed, you're better off than half the people in this country. Take, doesn't matter how much, it's not the amount of money that you save, but make that, install that process from day one. Spend less than you earn, take the difference, save it, invest it. It's tiny when you start, but when you get to the older gents on the stage, it becomes massively significant. Ladies and gents, I've hit my time, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, Craig Pfeiffer, absolute stockbroking, really appreciate it. Well, Smith, uh, Smith from Easy Equities, Pete Serpentine from Phoenix Investment Analytics. If we can give them all a great uh, round of applause.